Howdy, y'all! I'm Rissy, molecular biologist, skincare fiend, and all around mouthy broad. Speaking of mouths, today we're talking about lips. That's right, those kissable flap flaps on the fronts of our faces. Specifically, we're gonna talk about how the skin on our lips is different from the rest of the skin on our face, why it might sometimes need extra protection, and what you can do about that. Oh, plus some fun historical tidbits. First off, some basic anatomy. I mean, what are our lips anyway? They are fleshy protuberances that most, if not all, mammals have in some fashion, but ours are a little bit different. So the main kind of fleshy parts of our lips are called vermilion, which just means red. Now the area between like face skin and lip skin that's kind of raised is what is called the vermilion border. And what's interesting about that is that of all mammals, only humans actually have that. The skin around your lips, by the way, is called the perioral region. The stuff inside our mouths is called the oral mucosa. Sexy. Now while the skin on our lips shares the basic structure that the skin on our face has, so you've got, you know, your epidermis and then your dermis below that and then the subcutaneous fat. There's actually some very striking differences, which is why our lips look and feel different. So to start off, there are fewer sebaceous glands in our lips. Not no sebaceous glands, as some people might say, but fewer. There are no sweat glands, however, which means our lips do not have an acid mantle. There are no hair follicles in our lips, which... Thank heavens. I mean, gross. Can you imagine kissing somebody and getting like your lip hairs tangled together? <laughs> there are fewer melanocytes in our lips, not no melanocytes. Again, that's another kind of internet lie that gets bandied about that we have no melanin in our lips. That's absolutely not true. We just have less melanin in our lips. And finally, we return to our old friend, the stratum corneum. And the stratum corneum on our lips is much thinner than the stratum corneum on the rest of our face and our bodies. It's about like five layers thick as opposed to 15 to 20 layers that we've got on our face. Well, what does all of that mean? Well, it means first of all that our lips are softer than the skin on our faces oftentimes because the stratum corneum is composed of dead cells in a live matrix. And so those dead cells can kind of be rough and scaly, especially the ones closest to the top. Since our lips have fewer of those, they're gonna be softer in texture, which is why they're so kissable. Also, our lips are generally going to be far more pink than other areas on our body because we have less melanin. And that means that the color of our blood in the blood vessels in the dermis can shine through. However, again, we don't have no melanin in there, which is why not everybody's lips are pink. Now, because we don't have as many sebaceous glands in our lips, this means that they're much more prone to dryness, especially when you combine that with how thin the skin on the tops of them are. Because of these differences, they are much more vulnerable to the kinds of damage that can be caused by the sun and by harsh climate. It can be really tricky to keep them moisturized. Our lips are special, and of course, that means they are prone to special disorder. Now, what we think of as chapped lips falls under a condition called chelitis, which specifically refers to irritation and inflammation of the lips. And it can take lots of forms, but the, like, sort of irritated ring of dry, crusty skin that you sometimes get in the winter, or if your lips are particularly irritated, that right there, my friends, is chelitis. Some people are constantly licking their lips to try and keep them moist, and that's actually a terrible idea because our saliva contains a chemical called alpha amylase, which is a digestive enzyme. So you're literally like breaking down the skin on the top of your lips that helps protect against moisture loss whenever you're licking them. Also, moisture in the form of saliva evaporates very quickly off of our lips because there's you know, not very much holding that water in place. So really, this is the absolute worst possible way that you can keep your lips nice and moist and plump. Part of why it's so hard to permanently banish chelitis from your lips is that it's so tempting when your lips are really dry to lick them, but this is really only exacerbating the problem. I'm one of those people who tends to suffer from dry, scaly, lizardy lips. And like a lot of people, it's been really hard to try and find something that will not, you know, just moisturize my lips temporarily, but will actually heal that damage that's done by dry air and cold wind. In the past, I've tried lots of versions of chapstick, um, which you guys are probably familiar with too, and chapstick is a very sort of waxy protectant that comes in a tube. You rub it on your lips and it is supposed to protect them from like wind burn and cold air or excessively hot air uh, from the heater in wintertime. But the problem with stuff like that is that it only protects the moisture you've already got on your lips. And 
and if your lips are lacking in moisture, then it's really not gonna do much for you besides maybe prevent some new damage from happening. And I am far from the only one who suffers from this problem. It is a huge issue, and lots and lots of people are always writing on the internet about how their lips are per perpetually inflamed and chapped and scaly. Well, then along came one of my personal favorite types of skincare products, the Lip Mask. So, the Lip Mask comes to us courtesy of South Korea. In 2015, the company Laneige launched its Lip Sleeping Mask as seen right here. And no, by the way, this is not sponsored by Laneige. Um, they did not give me any money. I actually purchased this and did use all of it. This product very quickly became a huge cult favorite worldwide, in fact, taking the Western markets by storm. A lot of people described how this was able to completely undo the chelitis on their lips and give them soft, non-scaly lips that didn't hurt. And I'm going to explain how this product differs from older ones in terms of moisturizing molecules and why that makes it and similar lip masks so much better than simple chapstick or Vaseline. I'm gonna do a longer video about moisturizers like in general at some point, but to sort of sum up, there are three types of moisturizers out there. There are humectants. Humectants are molecules that attract and hold water. So the most famous of these, of course, is hyaluronic acid, which if you recall from my previous video, we have in our dermis. Then we have emollients. Emollients are molecules that sort of smooth over the skin cells and, and get them to lay flat instead of being kind of rough and scaly. Um, so they just kind of soften the skin. Most oils fall into the category of emollients. And then we have occlusives, which tend to be thick and waxy substances. This is stuff like petroleum jelly or just straight up wax. Um, and what they do is is they form a barrier on top of whatever surface they are applied to, and they kind of seal it up tight and they prevent what is called transepidermal water loss, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's when water escapes from your epidermis. And so um, occlusives hold water in your skin. So humectants kind of grab onto it, but it's gonna evaporate out of there unless you have an occlusive on top. And that is why they have this protective ability. Well, again, if you don't have any moisture in your lips to begin with, protecting what little you have isn't really going to help you out. Back to the Laneige Lip Sleeping Mask, Unlike other products that, you know, like chapstick or petroleum jelly, this is designed to not just protect lips, but also to hydrate. It's got humectants in it, and so do a lot of other lip masks. So it also has, though, emollients like shea butter and occlusives like wax. So specifically microcrystalline wax in this. So what you've got is all three types of moisturizers in here. This is originally meant to be worn at night to keep your lips from drying out, but um, because of like the beautiful pink color and the fact that it smells like strawberry candy, people would wear it as a lip balm during the day. It, you know, glides on and, and gives you that kind of like my lips, but slightly more pink tint. And obviously the whole world lost its collective mind over this stuff. It became incredibly popular, is still incredibly popular. And within a few months, there were imitators all over the place and lip mask became one of the hottest possible skincare products. A lot of people will say, oh, they're just useless. Why not just use Vaseline? Why not just use chapstick? It's so much easier. Well, that's because Vaseline and chapstick are just not doing it for most people. So if you are a person who suffers from perpetually chapped lips, if you've got uh, chelitis, then something along these lines is one of the best things that you can possibly do for your lips. Now, if you're particularly sensitive, then you're probably gonna wanna find something that doesn't have fragrance, but products like that are definitely out there. And don't let anybody tell you that you're being ridiculous in purchasing something just to apply to your lips because products are not one size fits all. The skin on our lips is different from that on our faces and it needs special protection. I'm actually gonna leave a link in the description for this video of a dermatologist's recommendations for how you can avoid irritating uh, your lips and, and making chapped lips worse. And it's gonna cite some things that you should probably avoid and things that you should do. Uh, much like with the skin on our faces, adding humectants and specifically adding ceramides in the form of moisturizers can be really, really beneficial. So they are similar in that way. It's just you probably need to focus more on occlusives in addition to the humectants and emollients that you might apply. 
This also means that you should be extra wary of certain things that can be irritating to your skin because odds are they'll be that much more irritating to your lips. Certain types of fragrance and of course our old enemy essential oils. What's interesting about lip products is that a lot of companies will put specific kinds of essential oils into their products to make them tingle. Um, peppermint essential oil and spearmint essential oil, also cinnamon oil are really popular for this. And a lot of people enjoy the tingling sensation, but here's a just general tip about skincare. Unless it's like a powerful acid treatment that you're using to exfoliate your skin, there should not be tingling. Tingling is a sign of irritation. That doesn't mean the product is working, that means the product is fucking your shit up. Um, as the French would say. Also, sometimes these products, because they irritate your skin, will make your lips swell up. And while I know the popular look right now is for big bee stung lips, that doesn't mean you should actually go out and get one of those giant Japanese hornets and have it actually inject its venom directly into your lips, no matter how big they will become. Don't do that. Um, Generally, if something is designed to irritate your lips, you should probably avoid it because, of course, in the long run, irritation can cause accelerated signs of aging, um, as well as causing things like chelitis. So yeah, it may look good in a photograph if you've got your lips artificially plumped up, but it's not worth it. Don't put wasps on your lip. Or metaphorical wasps, either. Am I making sense? There's a lot of really interesting history behind all the sorts of stuff that we like to adorn our lips with. Now, humans are incredibly vain, ridiculous creatures, and ever since we've been able to, historically speaking, we have been modifying our faces and our bodies with all kinds of stuff, including makeup. Now, the earliest forms of lipstick go back to the ancient Sumerians. About 5,000 years ago, they had, I guess, the equivalent of a Kylie Jenner lip kit. Um, they found these amazing, like, makeup cases, and inside was crushed gems in, in um, a waxy sort of paste that could be applied to the lips to make them sparkle. And these were worn by both men and women. The ancient Egyptians also used burnt ochre to adorn their lips, although this was more done for like social status than say to make yourself more sexually attractive. Actually, so on that subject, <laughs> oh, oh, oh boy. All right, <sighs> there is a field of evolutionary biology. Well, kind of. It's called evolutionary psychology, or EvoPsych for short. And EvoPsych is mostly a flaming dumpster full of the stinkiest crap that you've ever smelled, and none of it is accurate, none of it is good science. It's, must, it's mostly just just-so stories about how human evolution has led us to be biologically hardwired to act out 1950s-style gender roles. I can sum up the entirety of the field of evolutionary psychology with one image, and here you go. EvoPsych is particularly interested in trying to convince people that our lips are basically there specifically to sexually attract men. And if you put anything on your lips, that is to sexually attract men. What am I talking about? Well, <laughs> there have been a lot of theories put forth by EvoPsych types that the reason why our lips are pink, why we don't have as much melanin, is because they are meant to look like the labia on the outside of your vaginal opening. Yes, that's right, that our face labes are supposed to be lab labes only up here on our faces. There's one major reason why this is obviously not true, and that's if our lips are meant to be things that women use to attract men because they look like your cooch labes, why are men not trying to hump the faces of all other men? Because men also have lips, much like women, right? This would be an incredibly stupid system if we had evolved to have it. Thankfully, that's not actually what happened. In fact, uh, far more reasonable hypotheses as to why we evolved our lips to be like larger and uh, more protuberant than other mammals has more to do with our ability to eat soft, slippery foods like shellfish and thus diversify our diet. And humans are nothing if not omnivorous. Or there's also the fact that our lips allow us to make certain sounds like consonants, like puh, 
that kind of thing, which was crucial to the evolution of language. God, Evo Psych is so, so dumb. Just, it's mind boggling. No, the only reason we have lips is so you can have a vagina on your face. <laughs> and then there's also the fact of, well, what if you put color on your lips? Then you are definitely making your lips look like a vagina so that you can attract a big, strong, burly alpha chad man. The most common example cited with this is red lipstick. The idea that red is the color of vaginas and therefore the color of sexual attraction, and that's why women wear lipstick. There are some serious problems with this idea, and chief amongst them is that nobody has fire engine red labia. Like, if your labes are that shade of red, you have serious problems, uh, and you should go to the doctor. <laughs> That's not really how humans work. Our lips are pink, not candy apple red. So that, that idea has actually been debunked with a series of studies comparing the color of women's labia to the color of lipstick and uh, the color of, actually, the color of the lips on their face, and these things do not actually align. There's also the idea that lipstick is meant to simulate uh, how women's lips look when they are sexually aroused, that um, they are darker in color and, and more swollen, and to that I say, why would there be lipstick in any other shade than just my lips but slightly darker, right? Why would people be wearing blue or purple or green lipstick, which is totally a thing, right? Again, Fire Engine Red is not the color that my lips turn when I'm sexually aroused. Our lips are not baboon butts, Evo Psych people of the world. Thank friggin' God! Do you want a baboon ass on your face? Because that's how you get baboon asses on your face. This is just one of many reasons why Evo Psych is why we can't have nice things, and I cannot take anybody seriously if they subscribe to this kind of nonsense. Oh, and here's a fun kicker to all of that. The dude who basically wrote the book, like literally wrote the book on female human sexual behavior as regards Evo Psych um, and all of this nonsense, literally had to admit in a 2018 interview that his own work was garbage and all of the work that it inspired was also garbage. So the next time some guy tries to tell you the women only wear lipstick to attract men because of face vaginas, you can tell him to go pound sand. Also, even if there are some women who wear lipstick with the idea of specifically attracting a mate, like, all right, I'm going out for the sexing times and I'm gonna put on my bright red lipstick. Well, first of all, some of those women are gay and therefore didn't evolve that capacity specifically to attract men. And, well, for the rest of the women, there's no evidence that this is biological hardwiring, that they are compelled to specifically wear red lipstick to attract men. It's probably just that red is a really bright color and it's easy to see, so it attracts attention. There we go, I've solved all of Evo Psych. Stay tuned because I've got some very special programming planned for tomorrow. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. I will be hosting my first ever giveaway. <laughs> so until tomorrow, don't jab wasps in your face. Don't let idiots tell you your mouth is a baboon butt. And make sure to always use protection. Lip protection, that is. <laughs> Bye, y'all! I swear, like, every time I read the abstract on an Evo Psych paper, I can hear the bong hits happening, like... <laughs> What if, like, women had vaginas, but on their faces? Oh, dude, yeah! <laughs>